coming out today. Uh, good to be back in Fort Lauderdale. This is my second from last visit or formal presentation for the 2012 year. Final presentation, and fittingly so, will be in Africa, University of Liberia, the Liberia Hills Initiative. They're flying me out there to do some presentations on Garvey, Garveyism, Pan-Africanism, and the future of global African unity. But we want to deal with a serious domestic issue today, and that is the miseducation of African children here in the United States and in other parts of the world. It's amazing when we talk about miseducation, because no matter where I go, I find that the predicament of our sons and daughters is almost identical regardless of where we live. When I'm in London, it's the same situation. They have special education in London, they have ADHD in London, and they have all the drugs that come with that in London as well. Uh, when I am in Jamaica, St. Croix, Bermuda, Canada, no matter where I'm at, Los Angeles, wherever I go, it's amazing how this special education and ADHD demon is affecting our children wherever we are. So what I want to do today is this presentation, the miseducation machine, is going to equip you with some information that you can use to help protect our children in the schools and protect them away from the schools and protect them from the psychiatrists and the psychologists as well. Just so you all know, my first book, God willing, will be coming out on the first day of Pan-African History Month, February the 1st. You can pre-order the book on my website, drumarjohnson.com, and if you pre-order the book by New Year's Day, you'll get a free special edition DVD that's been produced exclusively as a companion to the book. When we're done here today, I want you to make sure you get one of these flyers. Um, it has the information for the book. I have them up front. And on the other side, it has information for a meeting of the minds that I'm going to be hosting. My organization, Team Pan-African, is going to be right here across the grass at the Samuel Delavo Community Center, Friday, January 18th from 6 to 9, and Saturday the 19th from 10 to 4. Totally free, doesn't cost you a penny, but you do need to register because we'll only have 125 participants. It's going to be a think tank discussion conference, not lectures but round circle where we talk about our issues. There's going to be meetings just for women, meetings just for men, and then we'll talk about some things together. The number one purpose of Team Pan-African, my organization, is to build several schools, residential, revolutionary academies for young African boys and girls. I was in Los Angeles speaking this past week, and there's an elder there who granted my organization six of his acres of land upon which we can build a school. And so we're looking at one location being in San Bernardino, California, right outside of L.A. I got another phone call this morning. There's a brother in Pennsylvania. He's an elder farmer, and he wants to grant Team Pan African several acres for us to build a school there. So initially, I was only looking at one international school, starting with our boys. But with the help of the ancestors, it looks like we may have several schools being erected at the same time and that we may be able to take care of the boys and the girls. So if you're interested in being a part of that movement to build a school district, a Pan-African school district for our young people, then please consider coming out to the Meeting of the Minds on January 18th and 19th. And again, the flyers will be out front. So let me go ahead and get into the presentation. I don't want to make the assumption that most of you know me. Um, I'm Dr. Umar Johnson. I'm a certified school psychologist with a doctorate in clinical psychology, former school administrator, also trained as a political scientist, Pan-Africanist, blood relative of Frederick Douglass, Garveyite till I die. This presentation is presented as questions, and I'm going to put the question up, and I'm going to give you the answer. In my book that's coming out, that you're going to order tonight, that book has a frequently asked questions chapter, which will be a very good book to carry around with you so when you have different issues with your children, you can just open up that book, Psychoacademic Holocaust, and find out exactly what you should do with a particular situation. What I find is that our children are suffering because of our parents' ignorance. Our children are suffering because of the parents' ignorance. And it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Schools don't give you an educational law guide. They don't give you a special education law guide. They don't give you an ADHD or psychiatric medication law guide. 
to help you protect your children. So I'm not blaming you. But what I will hold you responsible for is knowing that something doesn't feel right and you go along with it anyway. That's what I'm holding you accountable for. When you say, I don't think my son had a learning disability, but you let them test them anyway. When you say, I don't think my daughter has ADHD, but you let them diagnose her anyway. When you say you don't believe in psychiatric medication, but yet you accept the prescription anyway, that's my issue with you going along with the system. You have to stop going along with the system because the public school is the new prison. It is the waiting room. And unfortunately, many of our teachers are the new police officers. And along that note, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the news, but as a result of the uh, incident in Connecticut, and of course our condolences go out to the families of those who lost people in that shooting, whether they were African or not, we don't lose our humanity for anything. But what I find interesting about the aftermath of the Connecticut shootings is that now the executive vice president of the National Rifle Association wants to arm all public and charter school teachers with guns in the classroom. He was interviewed on CNN about four days ago, and they want to give every teacher a gun in the classroom. Now, can you imagine what that would mean? When you look at most of the mass shootings, they're not taking place in black neighborhoods. But yet, you want to put guns on teachers in black neighborhoods, which means that our children don't have to wait till after school to get shot. They can get shot during class. Now, we've been down this road before with the Columbine shootings. If you remember the Columbine, where a group of non-African students went into a school and shot up several of their schoolmates, and again, our condolences to those family members, but as a result of Columbine, which was in a rural white district, the United States Department of Education came up with the zero tolerance law, the same zero tolerance law that has gotten a lot of your children kicked out of school for simply saying something out of their mouth that they didn't mean or getting kicked out of school for coming to school with a pair of school scissors or a pocket knife for the Boy Scouts course. Zero tolerance laws that came out of Columbine is the number one reason for the rapid rise in black male suspension and expulsion. So here was a crime committed by whites against whites, but it ultimately negatively affected African children. And you're going to see the same thing with the Connecticut situation. So the only solution is to do what? Build our own schools. I don't know why we keep playing with this. I don't know why we keep trying to make excuses not to do this. But it's important that we understand building the schools is the only way. You cannot raise a child in an environment where they're taught to worship everything but themselves and then expect them after graduation to come back to your neighborhood and work for your general uplift. It doesn't work that way. Show me a people in history who ever came out from under oppression having their children educated by the same system that enslaved them. Show me any people who have done that. And if you can't, then it automatically means that we're expecting something different to happen from a system that has only produced one thing. African children who have been almost no good to themselves and their communities, but have often been much good to the system of oppression. So let us build them schools ourselves. Six sciences I teach, all African children need to be taught. And I don't see any school, even the African schools, that teach all six concomitantly at the same time. What are those six sciences? Agricultural and agronomical science. There is no culture without agriculture. And it doesn't matter how many doctorate degrees we have, how many master's degrees we have, it doesn't matter how many doctors and lawyers and pharmacists and engineers, if you cannot sustain life, by being able to feed yourself, you as African people are financially illiterate. We know dollars and cents and bank accounts and checks, but we don't know multinational corporations, real estate, stock, and how to flip the resources under the ground of Africa so that they benefit African people. We have to become financially literate, and that needs to be taught to our children. They should be able to go into business after completing high school, whether they have a degree or not. A college degree should not determine whether or not you are successful. This third science should be political and military science. History is good, and we have to continue to teach history 
along with math and reading and language arts and civics. Those are required anyway, so I don't need to mention them. But without understanding the here and now, without understanding your economic time of day, then history is only going to benefit you but so much because you can't tie it to the present. What good is knowing about Ramses if you don't understand the system of miseducation? What good is knowing about the dynasties of Kemet if you can't understand the mass incarceration of black men? You've got to be politically literate, not just historically literate. And a lot of us are historically literate and politically illiterate. We need to have both. The fourth science is the science of the black man and the black woman. The black young man has to be taught about the woman as a science. She is a science as God incarnate. And the black woman has to be taught about the black man. That means our children have to study each other. That's one of the sciences that are going to be taught at the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey RBG Academy for African Children. And then next, we go to spiritual and astrological science. We are a people of the stars. And we have to get back to understanding our spiritual destiny. So much is being made about 2012 and the age of Aquarius being ushered in right now. And we know from the Dogon and from the astrological systems of Kemet that the world isn't coming to an end. It's just that the world of certain people's control over it is coming to an end. We understand that in the age of Aquarius, African people are supposed to be returned to their ancient glory. That's what 2012 is about. It's about you and me going back to where we belong. Our children have to be taught that. And not being taught the worship of painting of Michelangelo's, excuse me, Leonardo da Vinci's uncle and 13 criminals that he got from a jail called the Last Supper, which is nothing but the last hustle run on African people, 1482. And the last science is dietary and nutritional science, how to eat to live. In our community, we have certain individuals who are specialists in how to eat to live. Bob Pearson down here in Miami, he's one, and you have others, but that shouldn't be a specialty. It should be required for all of us to know how to eat to live. And so that will be the sixth science that's going to be taught in the school. The Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy will be based on a 21 pathway program. That means that each student will be required to master a certain scholarship, which might be education, psychology, physics, philosophy, but they must also master a certain trade. So in addition to being a historian or psychologist, in addition to being an engineer or a pharmacist, you must also be a carpenter, a plumber, an electrician, a building mason. We want them to be able to use their brain and use their hands. Why are they only doing one or the other today? But until we get there, we got to deal with what's going on now. So let's get into it. children 
called Adderall, Sperterra, Cycler, Prozac, Risperdal, Depico. Why are you doing this? If you wouldn't take your child to the local drug dealer to deal with their problems, why are you taking them to the legal drug dealer to deal with their problems? Listen to me. You cannot prove a learning disability. Anyone in here who says that your child has an IEP for a learning disability, I don't care if it's reading, writing, math, oral expression, listening comprehension, I want you to prove to me that your child is learning disabled. Don't tell me what's on the paper. I said prove it to me. A learning disability cannot be proven. It is a hypothesis. It is an idea that we draw as psychologists based on the information that we get, but it is not a fact. ADHD is an opinion. It is not a fact. Emotional disturbance is an opinion. It is not a fact. Conduct disorder is an opinion. It is not a fact. And mild mental retardation is not an opinion. It is not a fact. An African-American boy in the United States of America is four times as likely as a white boy to be diagnosed as retarded and four times less likely than a white boy to be diagnosed as gifted. So you can only draw two conclusions from that current statistic. Either black boys are intellectually inferior to European boys or there's something sick and sinister about the process of psychological evaluation. But what do I find? The reason why y'all like to get your children tested, let's just be honest for a moment, is because a lot of us don't want to be parents. We got better things to do. And so we would rather blame the child for why he can't read than the fact you don't work with him. We would rather blame the child for why he can't sit still other than the fact that you never taught him how to. Is it the child's fault or is it yours? Why are we giving the drugs to the baby? Children don't know how to control themselves automatically, that got to be taught. But you send them to kindergarten in first grade with no discipline. And then when the teacher starts complaining because you know you didn't do your job, you blame it on the brain and give them some kitty crap. What are some of the alternative explanations for ADHD? Ain't no daddy at home disorder. 75% of black boys on stimulant medication don't have a father. Is this about psychiatry or is this about the black family? You lock the fathers up, put them in jail, and then you put the boys on drugs to deal with the fact they ain't got a father. Look at this nonsense. And how much money are the drug companies making off of us, sending our kids to the psychiatrist $50 billion a year off of you? Since when did black people start running to the system to solve their problems? Question number two, what should I do if I think my child is mentally gifted? Now, mentally gifted is a controversial diagnosis. It grew out of white intellectual racism. The IQ test that we use to test your children was actually designed by a gentleman, excuse me, an enemy by the name of William Stern, 1913, for Adolf Hitler's eugenics campaign. Let me say that again, because you didn't hear me. I said the test that we give your children for special education was designed by an Adolf Hitler scientist in 1913 by the name of William Stern. If you don't believe me, do your research. And you wonder why black children are 10 to 15 points lower than whites and Asian children on these tests. It was never designed to see how smart they were. It was only designed to justify oppression and lack of access to opportunity. Wake up, black people. So anyway, mentally giftedness as a movement was ushered in in 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Y'all remember that. That's when the Supreme Court outlawed segregation based on color. But they only outlawed segregation based on color. If you segregated based on any other reason, it was still legal. So for example, by law, special education, special education is segregation. But it's not by color, it's by what? Perceived disability. So when I say your son has a reading disability, he's now taken out of the regular class for a couple of periods a week, that's itinerant special ed, or for half the week, that's part-time special ed, or for the entire week, that's full-time special ed. But he's being segregated. 
The reason giftedness was started is because after the Supreme Court said you can't segregate based on color, certain groups of intellectual races came up with mental giftedness as a justification for the continued removal of white children from the black classroom. In other words, we're not taking the white child out because they're white. We're taking them out because they're too smart to learn in the same classroom with these other children. Are y'all following me? Special ed is the same thing. We're not taking him out because he's black. We're taking him out because he can't read. We're not taking him out because he's black. We're taking him out because he's emotionally disturbed. We're not taking him out because he's black. We're taking him out because he's ADHD. Really? If that's the case, then why would you look at the rates of black children who are diagnosed as retarded, learning disabled, and ADHD as a percentage of our population in this country? We are significantly overrepresented. In fact, emotional disturbance is almost exclusively a black boy thing. Conduct disorder is almost exclusively a black boy thing. Oppositional defiant disorder is almost exclusively a black boy thing. And where does the science come from? The science of the disruptive behavior disorder grew out of the modern eugenics movement that said black males were similar to black monkeys who cannot be taught how to act, so you might as well medicate them because they lack the intellectual ability to control their behavior. So every time you give one of my little brothers or sisters a pill, all you're doing is reinforcing a racist idea that says our babies ain't but two steps above an animal. And just like an animal, they can't be taught how to act. They simply got to be medicated. If you ever think your child is gifted, you should write a letter to the principal requesting a gifted evaluation. Don't expect the teacher to come to you. Why? Because mentally giftedness was taken out of special ed law a couple years ago. That means what? That means schools no longer get paid for diagnosing gifted children. Stay with me. Special education is about money. Let me say this again. Special education is about money. Every time I diagnose one of your children and put them in special education, Fort Lauderdale Schools gets approximately $7,000 extra per child every year from President Obama. It's a business. It's a business. I know this because I work in special ed. It is literally a business of making money off the children who were miseducated. With your permission, obviously. Okay? But giftedness is no longer in special ed. So that means what? They don't get paid for diagnosing black gifted kids no more. Is it still the law? Yes. Do they get paid? No. So if you want your child diagnosed with gifted, you have to bring it to the principal's attention. They're not going to bring it to yours because there's no money in it. Is everybody with me? Now, if your child is ever tested and the school says that they're either retarded or not gifted, mentally retarded, that's one end of the spectrum, low IQ, not mentally gifted, high IQ. If they say your child is retarded, I want to see the report. If they say your child is not gifted, I want to see the report. Because academic racism, academic racism, is, di is not diagnosed with a lot of black children who are gifted with giftedness. So what do we look at for gifted? We want a child who's been straight A's and B's for at least two years. We want a child who's 90th percentile or higher on standardized tests. We want a child who's complaining that the work is too easy and that they're finishing too fast. We want a teacher who's saying that the child is too advanced, they ain't got nothing to give that child. And we want an IQ score that's 130 or higher. An IQ score that's 130 or higher. But all IQ tests are what? Culturally biased, right? So if a black child doesn't get a 130, but let's say his son or daughter gets a 120 or a 125, we're going to make the argument that due to the cultural biasness and these racist IQ tests, that your son's 125 is equal to the white boy's 130. Are y'all following me? Same thing with your daughter. Because I've been involved in a couple of lawsuits recently where black children are being excluded from gifted just because the IQ score is a few points below 130. Now don't get me wrong, if your child doesn't have at least a 120, I'm not putting them in gifted. Because giftedness is not high average IQ. Giftedness is superior. 
And despite people's opinions that there's no such thing as gifted, oh yes there is. You're talking to a master diagnostician. Yes there is. There's children in this world, black and white, whose cognition and intelligence supersedes anybody else they age or anything close to it. So yes, I'm not one of those people who believes there's no such thing as gifted. Some children are much more intelligent than others. And I'm not talking about a child who's just hardworking. You have hardworking children. I was a hardworking child. I got referred for gifted in school, but I didn't qualify. Now, my good friend Mark, he got referred for gifted, and he qualified. Mark was gifted. I was not. I was just a hard worker. Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter after school because we all know people who are mentally gifted who just threw their lives away, right? So it's not the most successful people aren't the smartest. The most successful people are the ones with the most common sense. Are y'all following me? But we want the gifted label on your child in school because it opens up certain opportunities if they have the diagnosis. So if you're a parent who says, I think my child is gifted, but I'm not going to waste my time because I don't believe in it, you're working against their best interest. For an African-American child to have an MG stamp can go a long way for college, high school, and scholarship money. So unless you got $500,000 or $250,000 put to the side to pay for their college education, I suggest you get them tested if they got the grades. Number three, what should I do if my child is in preschool? They're three, four, five years old, and I'm seeing signs of a delay or a deficiency. I'm going to take my jacket off because I'm fighting the cold, and you know how you start sweating. Okay. Special education is from 3 to 21. Special education is from 3 to 21. So you got a four-year-old son, and he's displaying signs of autism. You got a three and a half year old daughter and she's not talking yet. She got some speech issues. You contact the local school district and you tell them that I need an early intervention evaluation for my son and daughter because it looks like they might need some extra help before they go to public school. Now, I don't like special education when it's not necessary, but I don't mind it for a preschooler. Why? Because if they get the extra help they need from three to five, by the time they get to kindergarten, the delay gap may have been closed and they might not need regular special education by the time they get to kindergarten. Is everybody with me on that? Okay? Don't act like there's not something wrong with your child when you see something like speech or intelligence or autism. I'm not talking about no ADHD because ADHD is a myth. ADHD was created by the Wall Street drug companies to make money off fatherless black boys. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about real problems, not make-believe. ADHD is make-believe. Okay, number five. Can the school reduce my child's grades based on behavior? By a show of hands, who says the school can reduce a grade if your child misbehaves? Show of hands. Only a couple of you. Incorrect. Legally, it is against the law to reduce a grade based on behavior. If your son had an A in reading and the teacher says, I'm going to give him a B because he can't sit still, that is illegal. If that happens, you should write a letter of complaint to the superintendent of Fort Lauderdale Schools, carbon copy the chair of the local school board, and carbon copy the highest state education officer for Florida, which is probably the chancellor or the secretary of education. You cannot reduce report card grades based on behavior. That's expressly why when you look at a report card, they always have a what? Letter grade, behavior grade, and sometimes an effort grade. They do that because you're not supposed to mess with grades based on behavior. Does it happen? Yes. Why? Because they know you're not going to say nothing about it. Number six. Can principals and teachers expel students from school? Can principals and teachers expel students from school? No, they cannot. The only power who can expel, all I can do as principal is refer your child for expulsion. You get a letter in the mail. They say that you have to come downtown to the local school board. Your son is being brought up for expulsion because he cursed at a teacher or whatever the situation is. Two types of expulsion, permanent and temporary. Temporary expulsion is a removal of a child from school more than 
11 days, excuse me, more than 10 days, but less than permanent. Any suspension that's greater than 10 days is automatically an expulsion. Your child can never be suspended from school for 11 days unless you had an expulsion hearing with the local school board. You need to know that because some of y'all children are being suspended for 20 days and you're not getting no hearing, no due process. It's illegal, but the law ain't going to work for you unless you make it. And as long as they know that you don't know it, they're going to keep on walking all over your children's rights. Now, if your child is brought up for expulsion, what rights do you have? Number one, you have a right to bring your own witnesses. Number two, you have a right to examine the evidence against your child. Number three, you have a right to cross-examine any person there who's testifying against your child. You are your child's lawyer at an expulsion hearing. Whenever your child is brought up for an expulsion, two things you should do. Two, right from the beginning. What's the first one? Look at the state of Florida education law, the code, and see if the code allows for a child to be expelled from school for the offense that was listed for your child. So they say we're going to expel him because he cursed at a teacher. Does the state of Florida say that a child must be expelled from school for cursing at a teacher? That's number one. Then you're going to look at Fort Lauderdale School Code of Discipline. Code of Discipline. And see whether or not the discipline code says a child can be expelled for cursing. Because guess what we're finding? We're finding that half the black kids in America being expelled from school are being expelled for offenses that are not even expellable. And how does a child get expelled for an offense that's not expellable? Because they know you won't do nothing about it. Charter schools are no different than a public school. A charter school is an alternative public school. The same laws that apply in public school apply in charter school. If they want to expel your child from a charter school, you have to have what? Due process. Now, the charter school doesn't have a local school board. They have a board of directors. So just like the public school kid goes in front of the local school board, the charter school kid goes in front of the board of directors for that particular charter. You plead their case, and then there's a discussion. The charter school cannot pick up the phone and say, come get Umar Johnson and withdraw him or be kicking him out. That's illegal. You have a right to due process. Skip that one. What is a highly qualified teacher? According to No Child Left Behind that was signed into law by former President George Bush, a highly qualified teacher, and he's no friend of ours, a highly qualified teacher is a teacher with a degree, a teacher certified to teach, a teacher who has passed a competency exam, and a teacher who has demonstrated the ability to teach. Now let me ask you a question. By show of hands, who in here knows whether or not their child is being taught by a highly qualified teacher, according to No Child Left Behind definition. Most of you don't, because you never asked. You never asked the teacher whether you're highly qualified, according to No Child Left Behind, and you never asked the principal whether you're highly qualified. Now you say, well, what difference does it make? Let me tell you. Black school districts are economic stimulus packages for unemployed people who live in the suburbs but who can't get a job somewhere else. So they get emergency certifications and they come into Fort Lauderdale and they teach your children with no degree in teaching, no certification, and no experience, right? Now that same teacher who ain't even trained how to teach got a nerve to send your son to me to be tested for a learning disability. How in the hell can you send a child to me for a learning disability when you can't even teach? You the one with the problem, a teaching disability. But if y'all don't know, if you don't know whether or not your child's teacher is highly qualified, then you don't know whether or not him not being able to learn is his fault or the school's fault. Y'all got to do your research and your homework because some of y'all are too lazy. And I'm going to tell you right now, with all the racism in America's schools, a lazy black parent is no parent at all. Now, follow me. I'm going to show you how we decide whether your child is learning disabled or not. I need you to get this. Because once you understand it, you'll stop looking for a test. 
you see them words, ability, achievement, discrepancy. And if you take your notes, you want to write that down. Ability-achievement discrepancy. Now, when did we get special education? 1975. There's no federal special ed in America until 1975. Now, I'm a 1974 baby, so I'm 38. So that means special ed is 37 years old. It ain't been around that long. Now, for all of special ed history, we have looked at the ability achievement discrepancy to determine if your son or daughter goes into special ed. Stay with me. We got a young man right here. Let's say he's in the fifth grade. I give him an IQ test. The two major tests in special ed are what? Intelligence test, achievement. Ability, achievement. I give him an IQ test. His IQ score is a 100. That's 50th percentile. That's average. His brain is working fine. He's average IQ, 100. Is everybody with me? I then give him a reading test. On the reading test, he gets an 85. And 85 is equivalent to what? A B minus. Is everybody with me? Now, if your son came home with an 85 on his reading test, would you think that he was learning to say? Is there anybody in here who would think their child had a problem learning with an 85 score? Nobody, right? We want him to do better, but he got to be. But according to this, a significant discrepancy. And for the record, that's normally anything 15 points or more. In psychology, basically 15 points or more is a significant discrepancy. So his IQ score was a what? 100. And the reading score was a what? 85. 100 minus 85 is how many points? 15. That's a significant discrepancy. Your son is going to end up with a learning disability and a special education placement with an 85 average. That's how special ed works. If you don't believe me, do your research. I've evaluated thousands. That's how they do it. That's why there's so many black kids in special ed, because they look at two numbers. They subtract one from the other. And if it's 15 points more or greater, he goes to special ed. That is sick. But you want him tested. And then you call me up. Dr. Umar, should I get him tested for ADHD? Should I get him tested? You know his problem ain't ADHD. His problem is that his daddy's in jail, but you too lazy to take him to jail. Or your new boyfriend is insecure and don't want you to take him to go see his daddy in jail. So he go to school. Yes, sir. Everybody with me? Mothers, I need y'all to listen to me. And fathers, if you're the custodial parent, I need you to listen to me. Prison, visiting an incarcerated parent in jail, normally the father, but it can be the mother, does not desensitize the child to prison life. It has the opposite effect. If my son comes to jail to see me, who better than me is going to let him know that this ain't the place to be? Are y'all following me? But if you don't bring him to see me, now little Wayne, who can barely last in New York jail, is telling him this is the place to be. People like Jay-Z and 50 Cent, who's scared as hell of ever going to jail, will tell him that this is the way things are supposed to be. So if you don't give him his father, then the thugs in the hip-hop generation step in and make your son think that it's something good about prison. Now, you say, well, I don't want my kids going up there. I don't like it. Men walking around with shackles on. It looked like slavery. That's true. But guess what? The boy of an incarcerated father is seven to nine times more likely to go to jail himself. So would you rather put up with the uncomfortability of the visit? Or would you rather be visiting your son when he got the damn shackles and jumpsuit on? What are we doing here, people? I'm part of a program now up in Pennsylvania with Gratiford Prison, America's fifth largest, where we have a fatherhood initiative where we take the children to visit the fathers because the mothers don't want to do it. It's necessary. It's necessary. So we got to cut that nonsense out. That's what the ADHD is coming from. Where else is the ADHD coming from? It's coming from mentally gifted boys who ain't never been tested for mentally gifted who are bored as hell in the regular classroom, the work is too easy, and the kids sit still and pay attention, not because they're ADHD, but the work is too easy.
easy. This ain't no math. You ain't got to be no genius to figure this stuff out. It's common sense. Or maybe you don't feed your children breakfast in the morning. Yeah, some of y'all looking real guilty. So they come to school hungry and irritable because they hungry and now they get slapped with ADHD. It's your job to find out what the real reason is. School ain't going to do that. Did y'all hear that? They only got one answer for you. Medication. Medication. So everybody understand how that works? Emotional and behavioral disturbance. Y'all see this diagnosis? Emotional and behavioral disturbance. Do me a favor. Don't you ever let your son or daughter get tested for an emotional or behavioral disturbance. Do you know what this label means? It's worse than ADHD. It's worse than conduct disorder. It's worse than oppositional defiance. This says that we don't expect this boy to do anything but go to jail. When your son is diagnosed with EBD, he gets put in a classroom where he sits all day with a bunch of other EBD boys. Y'all know that classroom. Because when you was in school, you used to walk past that classroom. Okay? Freddy Krueger classroom. They don't learn nothing. All they do is put videos on and rap videos so they can just be good. But they don't teach them. These are the kids who are, who are expected to go to jail. And the classroom is just a waiting cell until they decide to drop out, get arrested, or get shot. Now, how do you know if the school want to test for EBD? I'm going to tell you. If the school ever tells you that we want to test him because he got some behavior problems and we want to see what's causing it. If you ever hear that from a school, you automatically know that this is what they're looking at. How do we know that? Because of the 13 special ed labels, of the 13 special ed, let's see now, learning disability, autism, e uh, mental retardation, speech and language impairment, deafness, blindness, orthopedic impairment, traumatic brain injury, multiple disabilities, other health impairment, orthopedic impairment. The only one that deals with behavior is emotional and behavioral disturbance. So if the school ever says we want to test them for behavior, you automatically know what they up to. Are y'all following me? Is this helpful? I give you this so we can protect our children. But we do know that this is reactionary, don't we? Because to be proactionary would be to do what? Withdraw them all and give them the school that they need. The only reason why we having this conversation is because you ain't ready to dig in your pocket and pull out hundreds so we can finance the building so they ain't got to go for this nonsense. I just want to be honest. Because, see, y'all just had Christmas. That's right. Oh, no, he ain't going to go there. I was liking him now. Let's go now. You're talking about my damn white Christ. Okay? Black people in America spent over $20 billion just on Christmas gifts. In Philadelphia, we spent three billion by ourselves. Blacks. Do you know what you can do with three billion? You can put almost a school in every hood in the country built from the ground up for three billion. But that's how much money you spent from Thanksgiving to Christmas. On cell phones and iPods and Air Jordan sneakers that y'all was lined up outside around the corner like good little Negroes to get your son a pair because he wants to be like Mike. Now the sneaker costs what? 120? 140? 150, right? Do you know how much money it costs to manufacture a pair of Air Jordans? Seven. Dollars. They're made in third world countries by children less than the age of 10 in sweatshops. So if you want to spend $150 on a $7 pair of sneaks, that makes you a fool. 
Now, what I want to do, because when I tell y'all drugs are bad news, some of y'all say he's exaggerating. I know what you said, because even with my six degrees, I'm still African. And you've been trained by public school not to trust Africans. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you some of the side effects coming out of their book. This is called the pill book. So let's see what the pill book says about these drugs y'all be giving to our little brothers and sisters nowadays. Now, why is she upset? The reason the little sisters are going to school and they are angry because unfortunately some of them have been victimized by child sex predators who belong to your family, but you don't want to tell on your uncle or cousin, so you force your daughter to live with somebody else's sin. Oh, yes. That's a whole other conversation that we can have in this setting. Side effects of methylphenidate. Now, Ritalin is just one of the commercial names for methylphenidate. Okay? It's also sold as Concerta and Metadate. Okay? But the drug is methylphenidate. Meth. Now, let's look at the side effects for meth. Are y'all ready? This is for my Ritalin parents. Nervousness, inability to sleep, rash, itching, fever, hallucinations. That's schizophrenia. I'm not done. Convulsions, arthritis, appetite loss, nausea, dizziness, blurred vision, abnormal heartbeat, obsessive compulsive disorder, drowsiness, blood pressure changes, chest pain, stomach pain, psychotic reactions, changes in blood component, Balding on the head. You know what that means, right? That little boy you're giving Ritalin to, by the time he's 12, he's going to be bald as hell looking at you, asking you what you've done to me. Hold on. We're not done. Vomiting, agitation, uncontrollable twitching. Listen to this one, y'all. Convulsions followed by a coma. Let me read that again. Because y'all don't believe me, so I'm going to tell you what they say themselves. Convulsions followed by a coma because you thought it was important for him to be able to sit still long enough to be miseducated. Delirium, flushing, high fever, high blood pressure, dryness of the mouth. Be careful while driving or doing anything that requires concentration. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. He's taking the drug because the teacher said he can't concentrate. But they said that the drug can disrupt his concentration. Let's do one more. No, I don't believe in drugs except three conditions. If the child is suicidal, talking about killing people, by all means, put him on the drug because life is more important. If he's homicidal, talking about killing himself, then give him the damn soul off in the Paxil because the side effects will be less than taking his own life. If the child is schizophrenic and having hallucinations and delusions, give him the medication. Schizophrenia is a serious condition. But giving him a drug because the teacher said he can't concentrate, I don't think so. Let's do one more. Let's do, let's do Risperdal. Now, why am I going to do Risperdal? Some of y'all saying that Risperdal, where you at? And all y'all should have this book. You know where you get this book at? You get it at the supermarket. I got mine at the supermarket, $7. You ain't got to go to the psychology store. It's right there in the supermarket. You know, right after you buy all that sugar, all the sugar, Sugar babies, then you go pick up the book. Because most of y'all kids addicted to sugar, caffeine, and high fructose corn syrup. That's why they can't sit still. 
because you do know that table sugar was once considered a drug in the United States of America. Do your research. There's a good book called Sugar Blues. You need to read it. And it wasn't until the drug companies of North America lobbied the United States Congress to get table sugar taken off the list of addictive substances. That's why it looks like crack, weighs like crack, and got the same side effects as crack. Here we go. Risperidone, where's my Risperidone? I was looking for my Risperidone, but you know what I'm gonna do? Let me see if I got Concerta, cause y'all love Concerta too. But see, I want to get it out the book because if I get it offline, they can say that anything online, anybody can put it up there. You know, that's not verifiable. This is published by a medical organization, so it's valid. And you know, black people like to get stuff valid from other people. So, there's just too much sugar in the hood. But we'll talk about that somewhere else. Now, this is important, because some of y'all are going to say, well, Dr. Umar, I wish I got to you sooner, but my son is already diagnosed with ADHD. My daughter already diagnosed with conduct disorder. What can I do? Because the school already know, but I don't want them in special ed. This is your weapon. It's called a Section 504 Accommodation Plan. This is a civil rights law that requires that the school gives your child meaningful accommodations to help them receive their education if they do not have to go to special ed. Listen to me. I'm going to write a letter to the principal. My son, Umar Johnson, is in your school. I recently got a letter saying I wanted to test him for special ed for ADHD. Well, first of all, ADHD is hyperactivity and attention. It ain't got nothing to do with my son's ability to learn. So ADHD and special ed is not an option for my son. But I would like to come to the school and have a meeting so we can develop a 504 accommodation plan. If your son is already diagnosed and the school knows it, this is what you want to do. This is not special ed, but it gives your child the same stuff that the special ed kids get without being stigmatized. Do y'all follow me? The difference is what? Schools don't get money for this. They get money for special ed. This is why they don't tell you about this, because it ain't no money in it. You got to tell them. Now, if your son has a 504 plan, what does he get? Extra time to take his tests. Regular breaks from the classroom. A one-to-one -one aid if he needed. A behavior plan. Regular meetings with the counselor. Maybe an opportunity to call you. And if the school keep on complaining that you got to come to the school and sit with him, and he's diagnosed, you can say, no, no, no. I am not required to sit next to my son for him to get, for him to get an education. But by law, you're required to give him whatever he needs. So he can learn because of his ADHD. So because you made it clear to me that my son need a babysitter in class, guess who's going to pay for it? Y'all. And if you don't, I'm going to make a complaint with the Department of Civil Rights. Because this is civil rights. Your son having ADHD, the school discriminating against him, that's a civil right violation. Talk to me. How, how much time? Okay. Everybody with me? Now, we don't want your son diagnosed, but if he diagnosed, we're going to use it to help him. Are y'all following me? Although I would rather he not have the label at all. Okay? Autism. Why so many black kids have autism? The, the Food and Drug Administration will tell you it has nothing to do with the immunizations. I totally disagree with them. Not only do I totally disagree, there's a lot of researchers who are not African who used to work at the Food and Drug Administration, who have went public and said it's the immunizations that are causing autism, not just in black children, but in white children too. Stop giving your children everything the doctor feels like shooting in their arm. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. Y'all give them bird flu, swine flu, H1N1, Negro flu. Stop putting that stuff in your kids' arms. No black baby need no flu shot. God gives them an immune system. He don't need one from the system. 
and you don't need it either. Now, y'all going to say, well, Brother Umar, if I don't give him no shots, he can't go to school. That is a lie. There's only two states out of the 50 that require immunizations in order to attend school. Louisiana and I believe West Virginia. That's it. You live in Florida. So you know what that means? All you have to do is get an immunization exemption form from your doctor and you take it to the school secretary and life goes on. I know thousands of African babies who are not immunized who go to public school, private school, charter school, parochial school. You see that? They ain't got to get no shots. Well, you know now, knowledge is power, Baba. Knowledge is power, okay? There was no Umar Johnson when he was going through school, okay? I said, I think I'm the greatest thing since Garvey, which I am, but I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> now, 